With hypopituitarism, hypo means under, and pituitarism refers to the pituitary gland, which normally secretes various endocrine hormones. So hypopituitarism is the underproduction of hormones released by the pituitary gland. And the symptoms depend on which hormones are actually under-secreted. If all of the pituitary hormones are affected, it's called panhypopituitarism. Now, the pituitary is a pea-sized gland, hanging by a stalk from the base of the brain. It sits just behind the eyes near the optic chiasm, which is where the optic nerves cross, and the gland rests in a super small depression of the skull known as the cella tersica. The pituitary gland produces and secretes hormones when it receives signals from another part of the brain called the hypothalamus. Together they form the hypothalamic pituitary axis, which regulates the release of all the major endocrine hormones. The pituitary itself has two distinct parts, the anterior pituitary and the posterior pituitary. The anterior pituitary, which is in the front of the pituitary gland, has a few different types of cells, each of which secretes a different hormone. The largest group of cells are the somatotropes, which secrete growth hormone, which goes on to promote tissue and organ growth. The second largest cell group are the corticotrophs, which secrete adrenocorticotropic hormone, or ACTH, which stimulates the adrenal glands to secrete cortisol, a hormone that controls the stress response, blood pressure, and metabolic regulation. A smaller cell group are the lactotrophs, which secrete prolactin. Prolactin stimulates breast milk production and also inhibits ovulation, which is when an egg cell is released from the ovary, and inhibits spermatogenesis, which is the development of sperm cells. There are also thyrotrophs, which are cells that secrete thyroid-stimulating hormone, or TSH, that stimulates the thyroid gland. And finally, there are gonadotrophs, which secrete two gonadotropic hormones, luteinizing hormone, or LH, and follicle-stimulating hormone, or FSH, both of which go on to stimulate the ovaries or testes. The posterior pituitary, which is the back of the pituitary gland, releases the antidiuretic hormone, or ADH, which is made by the hypothalamus. ADH acts on the kidneys to decrease the amount of water lost in the urine. The posterior pituitary also produces oxytocin, which is responsible for uterine contractions during labor and milk letdown during breastfeeding. Hypopituitarism can be the result of compression, tissue ischemia or infarction, or iatrogenic or medically induced injuries. Let's start with compression. Since the pituitary exists within the super confined space of the cell catersica, it's super sensitive to changes in that space. Even the slightest amount of compression can interfere with the pituitary's hormone production. In adults, the most common cause of compression is a pituitary tumor, or adenoma, and in children, the tumor is usually a craniopharyngioma. Craniopharyngiomas are pituitary tumors that develop from the cells of Ratsky's pouch, which is a structure that normally develops into the anterior pituitary gland during fetal development. In addition to solid tissue compressing the pituitary gland, Liquid-like cerebral spinal fluid can also have the same effect. For example, in empty cella syndrome, the cella becomes filled with cerebral spinal fluid and it can make the pituitary shrink or flatten and ultimately become non-functional. Hypopituitarism can also be due to pituitary apoplexy, which is a disorder where there's either severe bleeding, like with hemorrhage, or a loss of blood flow to the pituitary gland, known as infarction. The more common way is hemorrhage and the hemorrhage is usually caused by pituitary adenoma, which is a benign tumor of the anterior pituitary gland. Larger tumors demand more blood, and increased blood flow means increased pressures in the vessels, which can eventually cause them to rupture and bleed. The second and less common way that hypopituitarism caused by pituitary apoplexy can develop is when there's infarction of the pituitary gland. An example would be Sheehan syndrome, which is commonly associated with pregnant women. During pregnancy, there's an increased demand for blood by the pituitary cells, and coupled with excessive blood loss during childbirth, it leaves pituitary cells without adequate blood flow, and they start to die. If the blood flow isn't restored soon enough, more and more tissue dies, and over time the pituitary gland shrinks, becomes scarred, and can no longer effectively secrete hormones. 
Finally, there are iatrogenic causes of hypopituitarism, like when there's unintentional damage to the pituitary gland during radiation therapy or neurosurgery. Symptoms of hypopituitarism can vary a ton, depending on which hormones are depleted. In general, luteinizing hormone, follicle-stimulating hormone, and growth hormone are lost before thyroid-stimulating hormone and adrenocorticotropic hormone. So if we go through these in order, first you have hyposecretion of follicle-stimulating and luteinizing hormone, together known as gonadotropins, and these can cause problems for men and women. Women might experience oligomenorrhea, which is a decrease in their menstrual bleeding, or amenorrhea, which is a complete absence of menstrual bleeding, and possible infertility. Men might experience loss of pubic hair and a reduction in muscle mass. Both men and women commonly complain of a diminished libido. Loss of gonadotropins is also seen in Sheehan syndrome, resulting in similar symptoms like absent menstruation but the loss of prolactin also causes problems with postpartum lactation. Moving on, a lack of adrenocorticotropic hormone causes adrenal insufficiency, or a lack of cortisol production by the adrenal glands, and that leads to weight loss, delayed puberty, and low blood sugar and sodium levels. Growth hormone deficiency results in a failure to grow in children, delayed puberty in adolescents, and decreased lean body mass and low bone density in adults. Hypopituitarism can also cause hypothyroidism due to the diminished production of thyroid stimulating hormone with classic symptoms like weight gain, constipation, hair loss, and low blood pressure. Finally, in addition to all the endocrine abnormalities seen in hypopituitarism, if there's a tumor or fluid buildup, it can cause local symptoms like increased intracranial pressures and headaches. The pituitary gland is also close to the optic chiasm, which again is where the optic nerves cross. So any extra pressure in the area will press on these nerves and lead to visual field defects, like bitemporal hemianopsia, where a person has partial blindness in the lateral fields of both eyes. Diagnosis of hypopituitarism is usually done by first assessing baseline levels of hormones in the morning, which accurately measure all the pituitary hormones except for growth hormone and adrenocorticotropic hormone, because those hormone levels are more variable throughout the day. Next, it's helpful to see how hormone levels change in response to a substance that should stimulate hormone release. For example, administering insulin should cause a drop in blood sugar, which in turn stimulates the release of growth hormone and adrenocorticotropic hormone from the anterior pituitary. If these hormone levels stay low despite the stimulatory effects of insulin, it might indicate hypopituitarism. Finally, MRI scans can help to look for possible causes of hypopituitarism, like tumors and hemorrhage. Treatment of hypopituitarism is based on correcting the underlying cause. In the case of an adenoma, surgery can be performed to remove the tumor. Hormone replacement therapy might be needed if the pituitary damage is severe. Alright, as a quick recap. Hypopituitarism is the undersecretion of any of the hormones normally produced by the pituitary gland located at the base of the brain. It's caused by tumors, pituitary hemorrhage or infarction, and by accidental damage during radiation or surgery. Lastly, it can be treated by hormone replacement therapy or tumor removal. Helping current and future clinicians focus, learn, retain, and thrive. Learn more.